Hi, thank you for joining us for Archive Dive. I'm Catherine Austin, and I'm the curator for the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, or TAMI, a nonprofit based in Austin, Texas. Over the last 13 years, our organization has partnered with the Office of the Governor's Texas Film Commission to bring old films and videotapes back to life. Our Texas Film Roundup program not only provides Texans with free digitization services for those films and videotapes, but also preserves and shares their uniquely Texas stories via our website, texasarchive.org. There you can watch more than 6,000 videos contributed by individuals and institutions from across the state. Archive Dive highlights the people and organizations behind the collections on view at texasarchive.org. With support from Humanities Texas, we will chat with contributors about their materials and discover more information about those videos and the Texans who made them. Tonight, we are watching selections from the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Since its founding in 1970, the Dallas Jewish Historical Society has amassed an archive of more than 15,000 items, including photographs, personal papers, business documents, religious artifacts, and moving images that chronicles the Dallas Jewish community and its contributions to the city's growth and development. Joining us tonight for our dive into the institution's film and videotape collections is Dallas Jewish Historical Society archivist and volunteer director, Jessica Snyder. We have Jessica with us via video call. Good evening, Jessica. Good evening, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is a real treat. And as a heads up for anyone watching that has questions for Jessica during our conversation, Team Tammy is monitoring the comment section. Um, but before we get started with tonight's program, though, Jessica, I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit more about the Dallas Jewish Historical Society and its mission to preserve Dallas Jewish history. Absolutely. Uh, our mission here at DJHS is to preserve and protect collections of written, visual, and audible materials that document the history of the Dallas Jewish community, to make these materials available to the public and researchers, and to keep the past as a living legacy for our community. And within that too, our vision is to help connect present and future generations with Jewish Dallas. And so we started in 1971. We began as a subcommittee of the Jewish Community Center. A group of concerned citizens started seeing Jewish heritage be destroyed, predominantly the Temple Emmanuel that was in South Dallas. It was demolished to make room for a highway. And they realized that there wasn't any avenue to collect and preserve Jewish history. And Dallas has a really rich history with great Jewish involvement. And so they started this committee and to create an exhibit and it snowballed from there. In 1980, we got our own 501c3 status. We have been housed here at the JCC in Dallas since, and we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. We've been collecting and preserving all sorts of Jewish history. You covered a lot of our collecting scope. Um, our big project is our oral history project. Mm -hmm. We have over 800 oral histories in the collection. Collecting actively, we have one scheduled for next week, oh, wow. even, and always, always collecting more. Sounds great. Alan, what can you tell us about the materials that uh, the DJHS contributed to Tammy for the Texas Film Roundup? Yes, yeah, so the Texas Film Roundup, that service you all provide is really just <laughs> such a savior for small organizations like ours. And I'm really grateful um, that we had the opportunity to participate um, in the last, I guess, three years, but with two submissions, over 100 items. Um, mm. at, film and tapes that you all digitized for us. And that was a huge undertaking on your part. And we're really grateful for all the labor uh, that you put into that. But it really opened eyes uh, in our collection to see some real gems that we had no idea that we had. Um, and it's answered a lot of mysteries and mm -hmm. allowed us to kind of dive more deeply and see some historic Jewish Dallas moments in home movies that are really precious and poignant that you know, wouldn't be seen now without without access to these preserved films. That's true. And there's just something different about a moving image versus a photograph. I don't know, it just captures something mm -hmm. different about, about the people that are that are in there. Absolutely. Mannerisms, body language, mm -hmm. the whole nine. It really speaks more to how people interact, how people live. Well, great. well, we can start watching some of these clips. I want to. See, I want to hear. I want to hear about some of these mysteries that were solved. Okay. But um, we'll start with. We have a 1940s silent home movie from the Khan family. Let's roll the clip. But and then I know Ruth Brown Khan was one of the founders of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. So I'm assuming this is her family. Her yes, her, her extent, extended family. Her husband, Lawrence, was the avid filmmaker of the <laughs> family and recorded the majority of the films we have in the collection. The Weisbergs, we just learned mm -hmm. recently, are 
his family, the Can family's um, relatives. Lawrence's hmm. sister Marie married Alex Weisberg. And until very recently, we didn't even know that this was filmed in Dallas, but it is. And it's I was, in yeah, North I was, was going to ask you about that. Because <laughs> we, yeah. were, we weren't sure. I really yeah. had no idea. Um, and I don't know who that very stoic gentleman <laughs> was. <laughs> I have a list of potentials. Uh, nice. But the Weisbergs, they lived, if anybody's familiar with the Dallas area, they were in Preston Hollow oh. on Jordan Way, which is parallel to Dallas North Tollway in between Walnut Hill and Northwest Highway. So there, it's right now it's an affluent neighborhood, large sprawling estates. It speaks to you can see how large that lot is and the house in the distance mm -hmm. um and so that that area it's not quite as expansive as it is in the film um but still definitely a nice area of the city and so that was yeah. fun to figure out on um, the cans um right there on the lake say? too Yes, yeah, little say. right there in the <laughs> yeah. right by their house and that little boat and the Can family, they were big um department store family and the Weisbergs hmm. were also an affluent family. The Cans, EM Can department store, um Emmanuel Meyer Can was Lawrence's dad. Um and Marie was his daughter who married into the Weisbergs. Hmm. Well, do you know anything else about, about Ruth? Ruth is actually remained a bit of a mystery for us. Hmm. I even interviewed her grandchildren recently and huh. she's a bit of a, a mystery, um, incredibly hardworking. And she also was really groundbreaking in that she got divorced in the early 1930s. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Her first husband, um, Louis Hexter, was a prominent lawyer in the area. She had two children with him. He remained alive and in Dallas for quite a while, um, but they, they got divorced and she remarried uh, Lawrence Kent. And they were married not for very long. He actually died pretty young in the late 40s. Hmm. She never remarried after that. Hmm. She is an avid community volunteer, very active in a lot of different organizations, not just DJHS. Um, but even in her oral history interview, she didn't talk a lot about the organization. She really hmm. just talks a little bit about her family's origins and their immigration from Europe. She was a, a private lady. <laughs> but, well, the following segment comes from the Ray family collection with this 1957 Silent Hill movie capturing the scene at Debbie Ray's birthday party, which looks like a pretty happening party, if I do say so myself, for 1967. <laughs> Just got like a living room full of teenagers dancing. Because um, I really wanted to know who the band was. Yeah, playing. yeah, well, yeah, well, they'll show up here in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. How does how does the DJHS acquire home movie collections like this one? Um, like people it, bring them to our attention, and mm -hmm. we we accept them. Generally, if the films are in good enough shape, that I think we'll be able to digitize them at some point. Mm -hmm. This one, so it's not actually Debbie Ray. Okay. I learned. I reached out to the donor. And this family had found this collection of films at an estate sale hmm. here in Dallas, just over on Royal, which is one street over essentially from where we were located and watched. And it came with a projector. And so he took it home mm -hmm, and I have it. It's great. <laughs> and watched some of these films and realized from some of the content that it was a Jewish family and thought yeah. of us to preserve it. Well, and fortunately, great, yeah. I, I have no idea who Debbie is, but she did yeah. have a really great 13th birthday party. She did. She really so, did. This is a crowdsourcing opportunity if anybody in the Dallas Jewish community wants to help <laughs> us out, identify yes. some folks, you know, who the band was, <laughs> let me know. That would be great. Yeah, here we go. They look pretty great. <laughs> I was going to say, too. And that's not the only collection we've gotten from an estate sale. Recently, hmm. we, had, we have two others that have not quite as large as this one. It was a large mm -hmm. film collection, um, but some odds and ends photos from 1940s, photos from servicemen, um, confirmation classes from around that era, too, that have been found at garage sales, estate sales, and things mm -hmm. that community members have rescued and brought to us. That's incredible. Yeah, Tammy definitely has had, has acquired some collections that way, too, both <laughs> ourselves or, or kind benefactors that have brought them to us. Mm -hmm. But next, we have an oral history from the Michelle Cerner family collection. And in this segment, Alfred Cerner tells the story of how First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt arranged emergency visas for him and his mother to leave Germany in 1938. Let's roll the clip. Try 
the time Munich, the Munich crisis came into being, my mother and I still didn't have, have any affidavits to go. Uh, and my father wrote us a letter saying, you have to go to the German consul in Stuttgart, which is a town 150 miles south of Frankfurt, where the German, where the American, excuse me, the American consul uh, resided. And you have to register with him because they now have quota numbers. He will only allow a certain quota, a certain number of people, Jews, to enter the United States. The quota number we received was about, uh, eight to ten years hence. So uh, with any luck, we could have gotten out in 1948 or thereabouts. Uh, we wrote a desperate letter to my father in, in New York, and he contacted a, another relative who had nothing to do with our first affidavits, because the affidavits that we got at first were from, from, from some poorer type relative who could only afford to guarantee two people. And my father drove to New Jersey with my brother and a cousin who took us, who took them, and found a influential far-flung relative whom he didn't even know. But my brother apparently made some urgent appeal to him to make some to contact someone in the government to make a provision to get his brother and his mother out of that place where we were. And for, through some effort, they got to contact Eleanor Roosevelt. And when she heard that a family was separated by a quota system, she absolutely flew into a rage. And we had an affidavit to come over immediately within four weeks of the time they contacted Eleanor Roosevelt, or this man who had a supermarket in New Jersey someplace, uh, who obviously knew her, contacted her, and we got an emergency visa to come to the United States. And that was in November of 38. It's an unbelievable story. But and he eventually settled in Dallas. And I want to know, what do you know about sort of the movement of Jewish immigrants to Texas? You know, was Texas a popular destination? Yes. Yes, actually, um, through both through the port of New Orleans and the port of Galveston, there hmm. were several different influxes, um, especially sort of at the beginning of World War II, uh, mm -hmm. before really the height of the atrocities. There was a huge push to get refugees into Texas. And... A lot of our prominent families uh, that are in Dallas, that have been in Dallas for generations, came through Galveston. Mm -hmm. And even during the war, following the war, a lot of Dallas Jewish families sponsored other families and refugees to come to Texas. Hmm. Was Dallas one of maybe like the main spot where immigrants were settling once they passed through Galveston or... It was a major one. Mm -hmm. um, Dallas has always been a major hub ever since the railroads came through here in the 1800s. Dallas has been a really vibrant light um, for refugees. And I think it, just, it affords a lot of opportunities. It's mm -hmm. always been sort of a depot uh, between other cities. It's had a lot of variety as far as work availability and other resources that really make it sort of enticing in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned earlier that the, the DJHS has recorded over 800 oral histories and counting. Um, are they mostly on video or audio tape? A combination. Mm -hmm. combination. At this point, most of them are on video and the majority of them are digital. Um, we had a huge collection of hi eight tapes mm -hmm. and mini DVs that were digitized over the last several years, uh, but also several cassettes. And we've mm -hmm. been collecting oral histories since our inception in 1971. One of our very first oral histories was actually Stanley Marcus's mom, Minnie. Mm -hmm. And she shares a lot of really cool stories of old Jewish Dallas and you know things pre-1900. Mm -hmm. Interesting insights. Well, and it's obviously a priority for the organization. You know, what what do they find so important about oral histories specifically, you know, versus other historical records to be collecting? <laughs> I think part of it is the cadence mm. of oral histories, the the nuances of spoken 
language is part of it. Um, and especially in doing transcription recently and really studying and working with a variety of different oral histories, different people from different parts of the country, people who have been born and raised in Dallas, people who have lived internationally. There's a lot of, like I mentioned, nuance about how people speak and relate with the world and share information. And I'm really expressive, for instance, and especially in the recorded oral histories, yeah. to be able to have this medium to not only hear people's voices and see their faces and their expressions, but you also get to see all of their unique um, body language mm -hmm. as well, which I think is is really important to capture, and it's it's more personal. I think mm -hmm. you get a you get a lot from the written word. Transcripts are a fabulous way to provide access to this information, and we strive to also transcribe these interviews because not everybody can see or hear the right. interviews, and you need to have other points of access. Mm -hmm. um, but they're definitely more personal. They're they're it's a really special way to capture history. It's a fabulous primary source documentation to the, to be able to capture especially so many the variety of them and you get right. so many different interviews for so many people who are from Dallas or have lived in Dallas or the region in the same periods of time but you get so many unique experiences mm -hmm. and I really think it's critical to record the collective memory and really get an accurate snapshot of what experiences were happening at different points in history mm -hmm. that you might miss in a history book or mm -hmm. another sort of curated way of sharing, sharing history. Mm -hmm. And then I know that, you know, this oral history came to DJHS through uh, Michelle Scherner. Um, and we had someone um, who's watching ask if they have materials to contribute, how do they contribute them to DJHS? So to contribute materials, uh, the best way is to contact our office, mm -hmm. uh, either through phone or email. My email is at archivist at djhs.org and set up an appointment. You can bring it by the JCC if you have a large number of large amount of materials that you would like assessed. I do site visits as well. I can come to your home. I am visiting the American Jewish Committee offices in a couple of weeks to assess their collections. So that's always an option as well. But make an appointment, visit the JCC. We'll take a look at it. Uh, really, the only time that we guarantee refusal of a donation is if we have a million copies of it to preserve space. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't need the eighth copy of that same book, mm -hmm. you know, um, but aside from that, we're really open. We want to record all facets of the Dallas Jewish or greater Dallas Jewish experience. It's really sort of expanding to other parts of North Texas as well. We have some things from an old temple in Corsicana. Um, very briefly, we had some things from a temple that was actually outside of Tulsa. Oh, wow. And we recently transferred those materials to an art museum outside mm -hmm. of Tulsa who had the rest of their holdings. Um, which was a great connection to make. Um, but we tried to encompass the region that, you know, that we really serve. That's great. Well, and then the rest of the videos in tonight's program come from the Dallas Jewish Historical Society's own collection. And we'll start with this 1950s silent footage of a Purim ball at the Jewish Community Center. Let's roll the clip. But now what does the Jewish holiday of Purim commemorate? The Jewish holiday of Purim commemorates, um, I just lost the word, um, freedom from a tyrannical king, if I remember mm. correctly. And so it's, it's a time of frivolity and celebration, and there's costumes and noise making and good food to eat and parody. Parody, one mm. local temple um, recently did a rendition of Shrek <laughs> as as their Purim um, play, <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Um, similar themes through Shrek, um, as you get in the whole story of Purim as well. Hmm. Um, and hang on, I have notes. Oh, well, yeah. Now here we see sort of like a parade of women getting crowned. Yes, yes, that is <laughs> Queen Esther. Um, oh. So Purim balls, they do date back centuries. Oh, wow. um, mm -hmm, from the mid-1800s. They started in New York, um, and they've been celebrated in synagogues and Jewish homes. Purim has um, dating back from the fourth century, and the oh, balls are, are a more more recent thing for sure. Hmm. And so the original origin story is detailed in the Book of Esther. Esther was a concealed Jew who becomes a queen and ultimately decides to divulge her heritage to her husband, the king, when she learns one of his advisors plans to eliminate the Jewish community in Shishan. So this dates back to the fourth century. 
And so Esther, one of her king's advisors, was going to eradicate the Jewish community in this little town. And so she decides to share her Jewish heritage that nobody knew about to then save her people. And it worked. Her king took her side instead of his advisors, and he was cast out, and the Jewish community was saved. Hmm. And so that is why Queen Esther is, is so important in this story. Um, the first balls have been, I had to research this, so we weren't really sure. Um, it was a way to secure a place in the upper social echelons in New York City, mm-hmm. and also get um, charitable donations for Jewish organizations. Hmm. And so they were deemed fancy dress balls. <laughs> and that was a way to say that there was going to be um, costumes. I guess costumes were frowned upon um, back in the day in, in New York City. So they said fancy dress. It was the low key way of saying that you could dress up all crazy. Dress in costume. Mm-hmm. Love it. Have you guys been able to identify anyone in that footage? No. We had no, someone. I, wa- yeah, we had someone um, asking if uh, one of the people was, was Ruth Andres, and it's like I don't know. You'll have to tell us. I will. I will ask her. <laughs> I will let her, one of her children is on our board. Oh, um, excellent. I had, yeah, I haven't had them watch <laughs> yet, but I had several people who have been in Dallas for their whole lives mm-hmm. who were in the generation who might have actually participated in that mm-hmm. ball specifically. And no one's really been able to tell me too much. It was donated to us by Sam Barshop, mm-hmm. uh, who was a prominent businessman here in Dallas. And I have a theory that um, Prince Piram is, is Sam Barshop. I haven't mm. found anything conclusive, so um, I can't say for sure, but it might be Sam, and that could be why he donated it to us. Yeah. Well, that'd be cool. You'll have, you'll have to let us know if you confirm these people. We can we can add them to the video descriptions for sure. Yes, I, I certainly will. I would <laughs> love to know as well. <laughs> but um, And then we remain at the Dallas Jewish Community Center with our next film. This silent footage captures the dedication of the Julia Sheps Community Center pool in 1959. Let's roll the fit. That's him on the left there at the podium. Mm-hmm. But um, who was Julia Sheps? Julia Sheps was a very well known, very well respected businessman in the Dallas community. His family came over. Um, when was it? His family went to Dallas in 1901, and they started Sheps Bakery, hmm. and which he inherited in 1922. And he later expanded his business endeavors to include Shep's Brewing, which was the first brewery in Dallas. We have one of the original six packs in our Mm. collections. Um, And one of his grandchildren or grandnephews is actually trying to recreate the beer um, with some (laughs) brewing experiments. If that that. ever expands, um, we'll be sure to let everyone know. But he became, he was on the board of the Mercantile National Bank for 50 years. He was the founder of Golden Acres Home for the Dallas Jewish Aged. And Mm. he headed the first biracial committee in Dallas. A major philanthropist. He was incredibly well respected by both the Jewish and the secular communities. That is why um, one iteration of the Jewish Community Center was named after him for Mm. many years. So the South Dallas was the major Jewish community a major Jewish neighborhood for a few decades. And around the mid fifties, everybody started migrating North to where Mm. we are now in Preston Hollow. Part of it's the highways going through the neighborhood, things being demolished. Um, Community members could no longer walk to services um, if they were conservative or orthodox. And that became a point of contention. So people migrated North and as the community started moving North, they wanted to move the community center, which is on Pocahontas street, which is sort of near where Dallas heritage village is now. Um, and so they moved it to where, where it is here. And it was dedicated in 1962. Um, but the pool, which was dedicated in 1959 and the building were both operational before then. Hmm. And they named it after Julius because he was sort of a neutral figure Hmm. instead of being the Jewish community center and sort of being this really visible thing in the community named it after Julius Sheps, who was respected regardless of Hmm. his religious affiliation. And it sort of created this neutrality for the community. Mm -hmm. I want to imagine to like potentially. And that clip. This is interesting. So it was donated to us by the, the Freudenreich family. Hmm. And I had to do some research on them. I think it was Izzy and Irma 
who were Holocaust survivors who met mm. in Lodz, Poland, in the ghetto before being separated and sent to different concentration camps. Mm. And when the camp that Izzy was at was liberated, he traveled around to a dozen different camps until he found Irma. And they were reunited and they got married. That's adorable. And then they moved to Dallas through the Port of New Orleans in wow. the early 1950s. And they remained in Dallas since. And mm. Irma died in 2020 at the mm. age of 103 oh she was goodness. the oldest surviving holocaust uh, surviving holocaust survivor in dallas at the time oh my goodness do you have their oral histories as part of your collection hang on oh. i'm having no worries oh no you me If all else fails, Jessica, I can type questions to you and we'll make it work that way. <laughs> uh. Okay, I'm sorry. I think my audience oh, no is back. You're back? <laughs> okay. you hear me? Yes, <laughs> yes okay. I can hear you now. <laughs> it's like we, we were going to make it work no matter what, Jessica. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I was asking, like, um, uh, were their oral histories part of your extensive collection at DJHS? They are not. Oh. Um, they are not, unfortunately. But there is a really solid chance that their oral histories are in the collection at the Holocaust Center, oh, um, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights um, Museum. And so yeah, if anybody's so. interested in that, definitely reach out to them. Yeah, to search for those. another incredible story. Well, and the following film focuses on women in the Dallas Jewish community. This 1950s documentary follows members of the Dallas section of the National Council of Jewish Women, including council meetings, community events, and as we will see, a fashion show. Let's roll the clip. I can't wait to show some of these fashions. They're fabulous. But that cape she's wearing is also fabulous. It is but, in those gloves. Mm -hmm. so and I would say, you know, for various reasons, we do not always see how women participate in and even lead community organizing efforts. Um, but I would say like the Dallas Jewish Historical Society is certainly a great example of the important role that women have played being founded by two women, Ginger Chesnick Jacobs and Ruth Brown Kahn, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, what can you tell us about the contributions of Jewish women to the Dallas Jewish community, as well as the growth and development of Dallas overall? A big Dallas, question, I know. <laughs> a huge question, uh, but a very important one. And one that definitely um, bears discussion. So the National Council of Jewish Women specifically, um, they're, they are incredible. Um, the Dallas chapter specifically celebrated their 100th anniversary not too long ago. Oh, um, they utilized our collections to help source a lot of materials for their book. Hmm. And it was really great being able to collaborate with them on that process. Um, but the Dallas chapter started CASA, um, court appointed um, advocates, advocates for, for children. And that, that's its own organization now. And it's national. And it started mm -hmm. in the Dallas chapter here. They started Hippie, which is a oh homeschooling goodness. curriculum system for preschoolers. And they, they help so much. It really is just an incredible organization. And so many national initiatives now have started in these little grassroots chapters. And it's been around for, you know, well over 100 years now. It started in the late 1800s elsewhere. Um, and in, for DJHS and the Dallas Jewish community at large, women run these organizations mm. and the professional volunteerism of these women, especially in generations past, um, the housewives and stay at home moms who raised families. And some of them also had full-time jobs, but then also run these organizations and they drive so many initiatives. As you mentioned, our two main founders were women and our founder, Ginger Jacob, she raised four kids and mm. wrote multiple books, wrote one with her husband um, did a whole bunch of her own research, got a master's degree, was on her way to a PhD, um, and did so much, so much, and just preserving the Dallas Jewish, Dallas Jewish history and mm -hmm. Ruth as well. And so many women who are on our board now and have participated in the organization, a lot of our oral histories um, were recorded by the same group of women <laughs> over a couple of decades who were incredibly dedicated. And they're the ones who find the time and can juggle all the balls and the plates and can make everything happen. No. 
on here, we you know we saw them doing some community organizing via a fashion show. You know, what what is what does Jewish community organizing look like in Dallas today? <laughs> Jewish community organizing is is a lot of meetings and committees. Yeah. <laughs> But a lot of a lot of the same thing, you know, people get together, they talk about what's important to them and what they want to accomplish. And nothing is out of reach. Mm -hmm. Nothing is out of reach, depending on who you know, who you're willing to talk to and what kind of work you're willing to put in. And the women that I work with and men, but the women I work with in this organization, and it's a lot of really strong, powerful women who are really behind a lot of this. You can accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to close this evening's program as well as the 2022 archive dive season with a look at something that will soon happen across Texas classrooms in the coming weeks, which are end of year celebrations. This adorable silent footage captures a class holiday party at Frederick Delegate Douglas Elementary in 1973. Let's roll the clip. I couldn't get over how cute this footage was. They're adorable. <laughs> They're so excited. But, you know, something tells me the classroom holiday celebrations have not changed that much between 1973 <laughs> and 2022. This is certainly what they looked like for me. But, mm -hmm. but we'll see later. They have a pinata, which seems very particular to the Southwest. Oh, definitely. But well, this is my favorite. They just surround the teacher and he he, he gets in on the dancing. But um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's getting down. Look at that. <laughs> even, the, even the camera person is getting involved, shaking in there. But, um, oh, so, you know, so this is one of... This is one of several films documenting uh, Frederick Douglass Elementary in the, the, DH, the DJHS collection. Do you know how the organization acquired these films? You know, does the, the school have a connection to the Jewish community or? Not really that I can find, um, honestly. So there's one little breadcrumb that might answer it for us, but it's honestly a little bit of speculation. Hmm. Um, I can't find any real clear connection between DJ Desar, the Jewish community, and Frederick Douglass Elementary. Except mm. that I have one photo in the collection of this woman named Edith Salzberger with two students uh, who were Frederick Douglass Elementary School students. Mm. And from what I can tell, they are not in this clip. And so I'm not sure if it's connected, as I mentioned, mm. but it's the only other item in the collection that's hmm. related to Frederick Douglass Elementary. Um, Edith Salberger, Salzberger was pretty cool, though. Um, she was a pioneer in art therapy. Hmm. Mm, pardon me. Working mainly in Washington, D.C. and Connecticut. Total pioneer um, hmm. for the whole, whole art therapy field and the importance of harnessing art to process all sorts of emotions and different developmental challenges. Hmm. And she, <coughs> she moved to Dallas in 1966 when she married Henry Salzberger, who was her second husband. And when he passed in 1994, um, she moved back to Connecticut. Hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse oh, me. No, um, fine. So yeah. an another mystery. Another mystery. I don't know. Maybe she's the person <laughs> behind the camera, which is why she doesn't show up. But let's go. <laughs> but. Very cool. But now those are some of the, the coolest things in the collection. Or there's some great Frederick Delgas footage. <laughs> okay, we're all good. Did you get, have some tea? Oh goodness. Yes. Oh, no, no good. And no, everyone everyone's sick right now. So we're so grateful that you were able to join us tonight. Yeah, but, um, those daycare germs, I tell you. Always. But um <laughs> we can to wrap up. How did the Dallas Jewish Historical Society use and access its moving image collections before digitization? Or was that even really possible? It really wasn't possible. Yeah. I had a list of what the label said. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, to the Alfred Zerner interview was um, labeled as daddy's tape. Hmm. So I honestly didn't even know yeah. it was his oral history. Mm -hmm. so I was expecting some sort of random home footage or mm -hmm. I mean, goodness knows what. And so the, the wealth of knowledge you gain by digitizing and preserving these films mm -hmm. is, you know, it's indescribable because um, mm -hmm. we really, really was no way. We had that one projector mm -hmm. we can watch some of the 16 millimeter films on, but right. I mean, they're clunky and difficult to mm -hmm. set up. And I don't have a lot of knowledge with those projectors. And honestly, I don't want to damage the film. And so I was apprehensive right. to even attempt to use it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, no, they were just tins sitting on our shelf, and we knew yeah. they were here. Yeah. But well, now, now they can actually be utilized. Yeah, I was going to say, has the organization <laughs> done anything different with them now that they have been digitized? Yes. 
<laughs> we have vintage ties and we have featured collection pages on our website mm -hmm. where you can watch um, the Ray family films, which I now need to find a different designation for since they're not actually part of the Ray family, even though the Ray family <laughs> saved them for us. Sure. Um, they can still they can still be their collection and we just yeah. you know, can just change how they're described. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's a lot of fun sports footage. There's a clip of these two little boys um, fighting judo mm. and things like that. Girls playing football um, on Thanksgiving. So there's, there's some neat stuff like that. So we have those on our website. We have the, the Lawrence Karen family films on our website. I've used them um, in 2020. Um, we called it our cyber soiree. It was how we were trying to gain traction and visibility right at the start of the pandemic. And we used those clips to bring traffic to our website and to our YouTube pages and really fun. I mean, who else gets to see home movies from the 1940s? Yeah. You know, and to have access to that and to really be able to utilize, you know, and almost be a part of the experiences of our community members mm -hmm. from back in the day is, is really a special thing. Mm -hmm. and we, we try to share them and utilize them as much as possible. And one other film um, or an oral history that you all digitized for us that was hidden on a VHS that was even improperly labeled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we found out later, um, name is uh, Regina Pierce. Hmm. Her relative, well, they had one relative who was a pirate is another story for what? a different day. <laughs> um, but they did have one relative who was in the Alamo. Oh my goodness. As well. And she shares uh, a little bit of that in the oral history. And we That's never amazing. we never would have had that, yeah. that tidbit of history unless we had had the opportunity to work with you all. Yeah, talk about Texas history. Well, I would say, you know, regional community community archiving is central to the missions of both of our organizations. And I think that's one reason why we worked as partners, such great partners for the Texas Film Roundup. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the Dallas Jewish Historical Society has already collected and preserved thousands and thousands of items. And I'm, you know, you're going to keep collecting them into the future. But if I may, to close out, what value do you see in preserving moving images specifically? The value in preserving moving images is... Oh, goodness. It's almost too great to even mm -hmm. describe. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, the same reason I think the oral histories are so important mm -hmm. because you see so much more mm -hmm. than you do in just photographs, than you do in just audio clips or just in written mm -hmm. exchanges. Um, be able to see. Well, and you also get to see the quality of the technology, right? And how that, yeah. that changes so drastically. Um, and that's huge. Mm -hmm. to, um, to see how far we've come as far as technology is concerned. But to really, you get to be in. It's such an immersive experience. It's like going to the movies, but on a different scale, right? Because we're preserving mm -hmm. history. You get to immerse yourself in the experiences and lives of the individuals in those films. And mm -hmm. you get, it's, it's a different experience. There's a different weight to it that mm -hmm. I think is just so critical to really knowing the true experiences of the lives that we're preserving. Well, I agree. Well, thank you, Jessica. We are so grateful that the Dallas Jewish Historical Society shared these collections with us and our audience as a contributor to the Texas Film Roundup program. And it was a special privilege to talk to you about a few of them tonight. And as you continue to get more, I hope that you guys continue to send them our way and continue to expand this collection too, because you can only imagine what else you guys might find. Oh, absolutely. The <laughs> second I have more for you all to help us digitize, you will be hearing from oh, me. Oh, sounds <laughs> excellent. I can't wait. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. This was so much fun. Well, thank you, Jessica. And if you enjoyed learning about these films, please consider sending us a tip, especially today for Giving Tuesday. Your financial support is crucial to our work and tax deductible. Make a gift and help us meet our goal of raising $10,000 for Giving Tuesday. We take donations via texasarchive.org slash support dash us, or you can text Texas Archive to 44 Three, two, one. Archive Dive is made possible in part with the Grant for Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good night, everybody. We'll see you in 2023.